Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Vincent Rougeau, and I am the Dean of the Boston College Law School. And I'm also the inaugural, inaugural director of the Boston College Forum on Racial Justice in America. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to our first, our second, excuse me, uh, launch event for the forum here at Boston College. Our panel, Black Lives Matter at BC, Formation and Justice in Higher Education. Uh, this is the second of a number of events that we'll be having this month, and I'll tell you a little bit about those in a moment. Uh, but what I'd like to do first is just give you a quick overview of how our event will work uh, this afternoon. Uh, after I give a brief uh, introduction of the panel and our topic, uh, I will introduce you to uh, the panelists. And then uh, each of our panelists will speak for about 10 minutes apiece. And then uh, we'll have a brief conversation amongst the panelists for about 10 additional minutes after that. And that'll be followed by an opportunity for you to ask questions of the panel. And uh, I will curate those questions uh, and uh, we will hopefully have another uh, lively conversation with the community for about 30 minutes or so. And I invite you to use the Q&A function uh, for any questions that you'd like to submit uh, for that portion of, of our discussion. Then I'll let each of the panelists uh, offer some closing remarks uh, following our conversation and we'll wrap up after that. So um, that's how our, our uh, time together will go and I, I'm looking forward uh, to a really interesting conversation. Uh, so let me just begin by uh, saying a few words about uh, the Boston College Forum on Racial Justice in America. Uh, this is an important initiative for this university at a critical time in the life of our nation where issues of racial justice, economic justice, social justice are uh, taking on a new urgency where uh, our political life as a nation has reached uh, a critical point uh, and our democracy uh, is being reevaluated by all of us in new ways. Uh, and here at Boston College, we wanna make a contribution to this important moment in our history as, a, as an institution of higher learning, uh, as a Catholic Jesuit institution. And uh, we have started to do that this year through the forum and our launch has involved a series of events that we hope will set the tone for the months and years ahead. So last week, we had a service of hope and reconciliation at the STM Chapel that was broadcast uh, to the entire community. This week, we have today's panel. Next week on October 22nd, uh, we will have a courageous conversation on racial justice and democratic citizenship. And the following week on October 27th, we'll have a campus-wide vigil uh, for racial justice. Uh, and all of these events are uh, available to you with, in more detail on our website, bc.edu slash forum. Uh, and we'll be putting out information on them uh, as they get closer and as uh, the details become more firm. So I would invite you to follow us on that webpage and to follow our emails as they are uh, come out on each of our events. So today's topic, Black Lives Matter at Boston College, Formation and Justice in Higher Education, uh, sounds a number of themes and I don't wanna take anything away from what our panelists will have to say, but I thought it might be interesting and important for me to frame a couple of things because one of the points I'd like to make about the forum, and I hope that will uh, be something we think about as we move forward, is what does BC, what does Boston College as a university have that uh, as, a, as an institution that offers us something unique or that provides something unique uh, to the, the conversations that are going on in our country about race, racial justice uh, and democracy and equity in, in, in our nation. And one of the things that we have, and one of the things that we value here at Boston College is the role of the work that we do in formation, particularly formation of our students, but it's really formation of the entire community. And I thought I would just uh, remind us of some things that we at Boston College have said about what formation means. Every college and university forms its students through the structure of the curriculum, the standards embodied in the faculty, the architecture of the campus, the way students residential life is organized, 
through the community's customs and traditions and the distinctive language the institution uses to talk about itself. All of these things communicate a sense of values worth pursuing and shape habits and minds of, and heart in ways that will achieve these values. This is what we call formation at Boston College. Now, formation can be problematic if the term, uh, if it suggests indoctrination or imposing values from the outside or stamping each student from a common mold that blurs their unique gifts and aspirations. But it can be a useful term if it means that a college proposes certain intellectual, social, moral, and spiritual standards to its students as worth acquiring and living by and equips them with the knowledge and skills to understand and critically interpret the world in light of these values, while also respecting their freedom to discern how these standards can be embodied in the decisions they make about their own lives. And I think that's true for all of us who are members of this community. And I think it's important for us to be thinking about that as we think about Black Lives Matter and race and racial justice in our current time. The other point I wanna make, particularly as a law professor and a law dean is justice. How do we think about justice? And here's another way where Boston College and the Catholic and Jesuit tradition has something unique to offer the conversation because we understand justice in a very complex way. We think of it as justice between individuals. We think of it as distributive justice in the allocation of wealth and burdens and benefits within a community. And we think about it in, the, in terms of social justice, solidarity and meaningful membership in a community, meaningful particip participation in a community. And how we think about those things matters and it has consequences for what our outcomes will be when we're trying to build a just society. So I invite you to think about these concepts as our, con our conversation begins. And now I'd like to take a moment to introduce our panelists. And I'd also like to uh, let you know that their full bios are available uh, online and in the chat. Uh, we'll have links uh, to those bios so that you can learn more about them. So our first speaker will be uh, Professor Sean McGuffey. Uh, C. Sean McGuffey, PhD, is, a director, is the Director of African and African Diaspora Studies and Associate Professor of Sociology at Boston College. Dr. McGuffey's professional work primarily highlights how race, gender, sexuality, and social class both constrain and create the choices survivors pursue in the aftermath of trauma. Our second speaker will be Professor Régine Jean-Charles. Régine Michel Jean-Charles is a Black feminist literary scholar and cultural critic specializing in Francophone studies. She's an associate professor of French and African and African diaspora studies at Boston College. Her scholarship and teaching on world literatures in French includes Black France, Sub-Saharan Africa, Haiti, and the Haitian diaspora. And finally, Professor Martin Summers. Martin Summers is a professor of history and African and African diaspora studies at Boston College, where he regularly teaches courses on gender and sexuality in African American history, medicine and public health in the African diaspora, and the African diaspora and the world. He has published scholarship on gender and sexuality within the African community as well. So I want to welcome our distinguished panel. Looking forward to our conversation. And I would like to begin our conversation with Dr. Sean McGuffey. Hello. Can everyone hear me okay? You good? I think so. Great. Thank you. Um, well, first, I would like to um, thank Vince for reaching out to me to be a part of this forum. Um, it's, it, it means a lot um, to, to be here and to be with some of my favorite people on campus to have these sorts of conversations. I also want to thank Stephanie, Nate, and Adam, who are behind the scenes, but doing really important work, making sure that we're all organized and technologically prepared to do this talk. And also, last but definitely not least, is people who have seen me give talks in the past. Um, I always take a bit of time to thank my ancestors, because um, I am not here by happens chance. I am here due to generations of sacrifice, those that gave both their lives, and others that gave up their own hopes and dreams to ensure that I am able to live out my hopes and dreams. 
And I'll make time to do that because I bring those ancestors, I bring those people who are still living, those kin, with me into spaces like this. Um, so they are helping me hold this space. They are with me and they're important to this conversation because again, I'm not here by accident. I'm here because of generations of sacrifice. And so thank you. Thank you, ancestors, for bringing me here to this particular moment and for this particular conversation. As I was thinking about how to approach this important discussion here, um, there are so many ways that one can frame this conversation, focusing on Black Lives Matter, personal formation and racial justice within the context of Boston College and higher ed more generally. I've decided to frame um, my contribution by you know, centering on Black Lives Matter as a movement and using BLM as a lens to understand formation, racial justice, and the ways in which BC and higher ed um, more generally can hold itself accountable to Black Lives Matter and the larger movement for Black Lives, which is a coalition of more than 50 organizations working to improve the social, psychological, political, and or legal lives of people of African descent and our communities. And I say all this to start because I want to be intentional about how I approach this topic and the ways in which I think we should hold higher ed and BC in particular accountable for Black lives. To start, for those that may not know, um, there are three founders of BLM, Alicia Garza, Patrice Kohlers, and Opal Tometi. All three of the founders of Black Lives Matter identify as Black feminists. Two have identified as either lesbian or queer, and one is the daughter of Nigerian immigrants. And they've talked about how these identities mutually um, constitute the central mission or organization of Black Lives Matter. In short, Black Lives Matter is intersectional in its quest for racial injustice. And while most folks may think of BLM as a protest movement, the founders are clear that Black Lives Matter is, quote, an ideological and political intervention in a world where Black lives are systematically and intentionally targeted. It is an affirmation of Black folks' humanity, our contributions to society, and our resilience. I want to focus on two words in this statement by the founders, intervention and affirmation. Intervention is important because it suggests that responding and addressing harm is not good enough. We must intervene to prevent the harm from actually happening in the first place. And while protest is certainly one form of intervention, there are many others, such as police reform, making sure that the most marginalized members of our society, like Black trans women, have access to preventative health care and making sure Black educa educators are not only acknowledged in higher ed, but actually given access to institutional power that can lead to systemic change. And second, the, word, the second word in the statement I wanna highlight is affirmation. And this is equally important because the assault on Black lives is not just legal, extrajudicial, and physical, and disproportionately lethal is also a spiritual assault on the very humanity of people of African descent. That's why affirmation is central to understanding why and how Black Lives Matter. And it's the affirmation of all Black lives, including but not limited to Blacks who are women, queer, trans, lacking formal education, immigrant, poor, incarcerated, formerly incarcerated, non-Christian, and yes, those who are ratchet as well. Turning this Black Lives Matters gaze at BC, I, I can honestly say I've seen some real signs of hope in both the areas of interventions and affirmations in my almost 15 years here at BC. I continue to be impressed with the activities of the Thea Bowman Ahana and Intercultural Center. The staff and students there are doing important work, mentoring Ahana undergraduate students, teaching them important research skills that will help them in the classroom and beyond, 
building in community, affirming each other, affirming each other's identities, affirming their humanity, and providing important financial support to some of our most marginalized students. So for those that are not familiar with the number and quality of services provided by the center, I highly recommend that you get familiar with them, including faculty that might want to get involved in some of the programming. Another key way that BC is providing important interventions and affirmations is through the new core curriculum. My students that have known me over the years know that I love teaching in the core. I've taught every part of the core. I've experienced um, in many key ways, important um, understandings about student formation by teaching in the core. And although it doesn't necessarily have to, it can contribute to student formation in ways that affirms Black lives in the ways that the founders of BLM, I think, would support. If we think of student formation as educating the whole person, intellectually, socially, and morally, the new core has great potential to do so while providing an intervention that can help reduce harm to Black lives and affirm Black lives. For instance, I am lucky to be co-teaching uh, for the second time a complex course called Where Black Lives Matter Meets Me To um, with Professor John Charles, who's on this um, discussion as well. And in this course, we are clearly affirming the dignity of Black lives, and I mean all Black lives, um, every single day. And we're also setting the stage for students to develop intervention strategies to the community engagement components of our course. This time around, of course, it's a little different due to COVID and the importance of social distancing, but students are still engaging with community members virtually in important ways that leads to social justice. By providing this framework, students are, are, um, aren't only gaining important critical thinking skills, but they're, um, but they're also into using these intellectual skills to work on real world complex problems and develop interventions strategies with communities. So it's not just students working with other students, thinking about what they see best for more marginalized communities or those that have been subject to violence, but actually working with those communities and realizing that while they are gaining knowledge in the classroom, sometimes it pales in comparison to what they are learning and experiencing working for justice outside of the classroom. Now, I've done this for a couple of cycles now, and in various classes, I can tell you that this requires students to be reflective think about their purpose in life, and I can see the growth of students not only throughout the semester, but also throughout their time at BC. As many of these, of these students stay connected with us as professors that teach the course and with each other, and they become the leaders on campus. And I think these formation processes may be an important reason why they become leaders in the BC community and beyond. And so well, although there are ways in which I think BC does some important work on affirming and providing interventions um, that would be amenable to Black Lives Matter, there's also important ways I think BC falls short, and not just BC, but higher ed in general. And we need, and part of what I find that um, BC can work better on to improve affirming Black lives and providing intervention studies to prevent harm to Black people is that BC needs to focus more on the specificity of anti-Black racism rather than racism as a whole. In one of my courses where I teach about comparative racism within the context of the US, we address how different racialized groups have experienced racism. And while there are certain overlaps, there are also vast differences. Anti-Asian racism looks very different from anti-Black racism, which is also very different from anti-Indigenous racism. So while coalitions are very important and we need to address all forms of racism, when we do not talk about and address the specificity of anti-Black racism, people of African descent will continue to be left behind. And we see that when we look at our own student climate survey here at Boston College. In their survey, we see that whites feel most welcome, which isn't a surprise, but those that identify as Asian, Hispanic of any race, or being two or more races 
aren't that far behind what whites in their feelings of welcomeness at Boston College. The quantity of data though shows that those identifying as black or African American have a qualitatively different experience and aren't feeling as welcome. Therefore, focusing on the entire Ohio community as a whole, rather than a specificity of anti-Blackness at BC, is not going to trickle down to help Black students. We need to affirm the lives of Black students specifically and focus on the specificity of anti-Blackness to make sustainable interventions here at BC and in higher ed more generally. And I've seen this throughout my almost 15 years here at BC where students will ask um, an administrator or a professor um, a question or address an issue about anti-Blackness at BC and the professor or administrator will respond about the entire Ohana community, erasing the specificity of anti-Blackness at BC's campus. Um, and we see this and other avenues outside of BC as well, where um, Black people will talk about the specificity of anti-Black racism, and whoever we're talking to, whether it be journalists, politicians, will talk about people of color more generally. Again, erasing the experiences and the specificity of anti-Black racism. And also, when we're having these conversations at BC, I know I'm, I'm out of time, so I'll just wrap up real quickly. We have to think about how we are, what we're not talking about at BC or how we address difficult conversations. Because um, one of the things that's really hitting home for a lot for myself and a lot of students who are in the class that I'm teaching now on Black Lives Matter, uh, where Black Lives Matter meets me too, we have to think about the mental, emotional, and moral gymnastics that students and others in the BC community must maneuver as we try to teach, learn, and develop intervention strategies that will support the movement for Black lives while trying to do that in a building named after someone that both those within and outside of the BC community have documented as practicing anti-Black racism. So how is that affirming Black lives when we still have buildings named after people that the city has already said has had a uh, uh, has practiced anti-black racism other outside organizations have talked about this so how are we affirming black lives and being able to protect those students faculty and administrators who must work under these conditions and i know i'm out of time so i will end it there thank you thank you so much uh, let me turn it now to uh, Dr. Jean Charles. Thank you. Thank you so much um, again to everyone who helped to put this together. Thank you um, so much to my colleagues, uh, my African and African diaspora colleagues, diaspora studies colleagues, and um, thank you to all of you for being here. Um, before I begin, I actually do want to acknowledge, especially as this week is. Um, Indigenous, uh, we had on Monday, Indigenous Peoples Day. I do want to acknowledge um, that I'm sitting here in my home in Milton, and that Milton is where the Wampanoag tribe um, first inhabited this land. And so I want to honor our Native siblings and remember um, the genocide that so many of them had to give their lives to. Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. All Black lives matter. Black women's lives matter. Black non-binary lives matter. Black men's lives matter. Black trans lives matter. Black children's lives matter. Our lives matter. I begin purposefully with that repetition because the utterance of that phrase should never be taken lightly. It has become a sacred refrain. It is a statement that is also a rallying cry. It is an affirmation, as my colleague Sean talked about so beautiful, an affirmation of life. It is a declaration that though racism is the air that we breathe, our breath is indeed sacred. The refrain is a rallying cry, a communal response, a reflection, and an invitation. 
It is an invitation for us now to reflect and to take seriously, what does it mean? What would it look like to be at a university where Black Lives Matter? What should it look like? What does it look like at Boston College to affirm that Black Lives Matter? Black Lives Matter represents one of the most important utterances about the status of racial justice in the 21st century. It is a simple affirmation whose necessity reveals the kind of world that we live in. To understand that all Black Lives Matter is to appreciate intersectionality and to comprehend the depths of the struggle against anti-Black racism in the United States and abroad. When we say Black Lives Matter, we affirm Black life and recognize a humanity that has too often been denied throughout history to the present day. Black Lives Matter should not be necessary to speak, but given the continuous cycle of anti-Black violence, racist abuse, and the stronghold of white supremacy, we say it, we scream it, and we teach it over and over again. When Alicia Garza first used that phrase, Black Lives Matter, in 2013, after the acquittal of George Zimmerman, who killed Trayvon Martin, he deserved to be killed with impunity. We need to love ourselves and fight for a world where Black Lives Matter. Black people, I love you. I love us. We matter. Our lives matter, end quote. Black Lives Matter. It was a love letter that launched the movement. What does it mean to us, especially here at a Jesuit institution, that love was the genesis of Black Lives Matter? It actually isn't that far of a leap, right? According to philosopher and public intellectual Cornel West, we must never forget that justice is what love looks like in public. Led by an abiding love for all humanity, the founders of Black Lives Matter have worked hard to make sure that the lives of Black people are just as valuable as the lives of others. Now, when I think about formation and justice in higher education, love is really what first comes to mind. There can be no formation and no justice without an attention to love. The imperative to be attentive, to be reflective, and to be loving as the pillars of formative education fit seamlessly into Black Lives Matter as an intervention and as an ideology, as my colleague stated. I have seen this at work in both my teaching, in, in my teaching both inside and outside of the classroom. Now, while this is a forum on racial justice in America, to me, one of the most salient examples that I have to offer comes from a time when I was abroad with students. During the summer of 2019, I taught a course in Paris entitled Paris Noir. I had 13 students, most of whom actually had taken our class uh, where hashtag Black Lives Matter meets hashtag Me Too that Professor McGuffey spoke about. And all of my students were women also, which was fascinating. It was like my Wellesley College semester. Um, so the class Paris Noir, where the literature and culture of Black Paris, we examined the negritude movement of the 1930s that was begun by a group of Black students who migrated there. We explored theories of race and racism by canonical thinkers like Franz Fanon. We read novels by authors like Giselle Pinault from Guadeloupe and Fatou Diome, who immigrated from Senegal at the age of 18. We watch documentaries like Ouvrir la Voix by Amadine Gay, which chronicles how racism and sexism affect Black French women. We had an amazing roster of speakers, including the well-known Afro-French journalist Rokaya Diallo, who now works for the Washington Post. And our final speaker was Asa Traoré, a Malian-born activist who has been at the helm of the Black Lives Matter movement in France since her brother, Adama Traoré, was killed by police in 2016. When my students learned about the Black Lives Matter movement in France, their eyes were opened to the global reverberations of anti-Blackness. Many of them had participated in and led demonstrations on BC's campus themselves and really considered themselves activists. 
because they had studied the history and the literature, they were able to situate the Black Lives Matter movement in Paris in a broader context of anti-Black racism that French intellectuals, writers, and artists had been documenting for decades. I wanted my students to think critically about Black Lives Matter as a global movement and to understand that anti-Blackness was not only a US problem and to situate it within a larger Black Studies intellectual project. Asa Traoré's visit to our class was especially powerful because she laid out a strategic plan for social justice organizing. I had to translate for her and I remember writing, scribbling so fast because she was saying so many wonderful things. And she kept saying, il ne faut pas rester à sa place. You must not stay in your place. Il faut s'imposer. You must impose yourself. You must assert yourself. You must put yourself forward. She kept repeating this over and over during her visit. Her visit occurred during the last week of class. With her inspiration, we ended our time together on an incredibly high note. But the joy of that high note threatened to dissipate a couple of nights later when my students in their last night in Paris went to a club and witnessed a scene of police brutality. They watched in horror as people were exiting the club and the French police grabbed a black man, handled him brutally, shoved him. I remember them saying, it looked like he couldn't breathe. Walking home from the scene, a few of them who were Muslim prayed for the safety together of the brother that they saw being taken by police. They wondered if he, like Adama Traoré and so many other Black Frenchmen would die in police custody. They were traumatized. I think the message I got from them was about at four in the morning. <laughs> it said, Professor, we need you. <laughs> the following morning, we gathered together in what I called a reflection circle to discuss what they had witnessed. Among the things that bothered them the most were the fact that there were other people in the crowd outside of the nightclub that didn't even seem to be attentive to what was going on. My students were taking out their cameras and filming and shouting, and they were so disturbed that others didn't notice. My students were being attentive to what was happening around them knowing that police brutality is an insidious reality of Parisian life. So I share this anecdote because it demonstrates that affirming Black lives is exactly where justice and formative in education intersect. It's where and how we teach students to be attentive, to be reflective, and to be loving. And then it requires us to confront injustice and not to turn away from incidents of pain and suffering. It requires that we acknowledge the hurt and the harm caused by institutions, even perhaps especially those that we hold in high esteem. I had to encourage my students in that reflection circle to delve into the pain and the harm that they witnessed, to process what it felt like to witness such an egregious disregard of Black life firsthand. To be clear, the goal was not to have them move past it, but to work through it and figure out what healing and justice might look like in the context of what they just saw, knowing that they were leaving to go back to the United States. What I saw in my students was not only an ability to analyze what happened in a way, um, excuse me, analyze what had happened in relation to the history of anti-Black racism that they had been studying all summer, but also a desire to be attentive to what leads to action. Their desire for justice motivated them to think about next steps and actions and how they continue to make sure that even when they go to the United States, people know about police brutality also happening in France. The great feminist writer, Tony K. Bambara wrote that, quote, the job of the writer is to make revolution irresistible. In my view, the job of the formative educator is to make justice irresistible. We can tell our students about the role of self-reflection and social justice, but it means nothing if we don't model it in our lives ourselves. In other words, if we do not behave as though Black Lives Matter to our students, they will not believe us when we say Black Lives Matter. As a person of faith, I turn to the Bible, which tells me that faith without works is dead. 
And despite my belief in the power of words, I know that words without work are futile. In higher education, words often take, words without action often take the form of task forces, diversity and inclusion positions, even forums like this one. But the question for us and one that we must address is what kind of action will we take after listening to these words? The place where formative education and Black Lives Matter intersect tells us that we have to be attentive to Black lives, we have to be reflective about Black Lives Matter, and we have to be loving to Black people, all Black people, whether we are Black people ourselves. Black people on not only the faculty, students, staff, and administrators on this campus, but those who we may not even know. The work of justice demands that we do so as an act of love. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, Dr. Summers. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, like my uh, colleagues, I want to thank Vince uh, for inviting me to be on the panel and for everyone who made this possible. I've actually been on a panel a couple of times with uh, Professor McGuffey, and it's always nice to share the space with him. As I believe this is the first time I've ever been on a panel with uh, Professor John Charles, and uh, uh, next time we're on a panel, I think I'll ask to go before her because uh, <laughs> both of both of these presentations uh, by Professor John Charles and, and McGuffey are going to be uh, difficult uh, to follow. But uh, so. We were tasked, uh, at least in part, with discussing how uh, Black Lives Matter and racial justice more broadly inform our teaching and the other ways in which we engage in not only student formation, but uh, community formation on the campus of, of BC. And so I want to start uh, my comments with a little anecdote that uh, speaks to the importance and the urgency, I think, of, of centering of Black Lives Matter, and, and particularly, uh, as Professor McGuffey said, uh, the, the importance of affirmation uh, that Black Lives Matter in our work at uh, this university. Um, so the, the anecdote that I want to share uh, involves the 1619 Project, um, Hannah, uh, Nicole Hannah Jones's sweeping portrait of the centrality of slavery, racial capitalism, and uh, racism to American identity in nearly every facet of American life. And uh, it was last fall, so the 1619 Project was published uh, or issued in August of, of uh, 2019. And that uh, fall semester, I was teaching my history of medicine and public health in the African diaspora a course. And on the very first day of class, I referenced uh, the 1619 Project because I'd been thinking a lot about it. And uh, it was met with a bunch of blank stares. And uh, just to give you a, kind of a rough uh, demographic breakdown of the class, it was probably about 75% white students, 25% Ahan students, but a handful of, of students of African descent. So I pressed uh, my class uh, on whether anyone knew what event uh, occurred 400 years ago that we were now in the midst of uh, uh, commemorating and uh, was met in with, with utter silence. And um, I, sh I was shocked that, that no one knew, uh, partly because there had been so much press about the uh, 1619 Project. Um, that I thought well, you know, people would have to be living under a rock not to, uh, not to know what this was referring to. Now, in retrospect, I guess there was no reason uh, that 1619 uh, should be a reference for thinking about the entire uh, African diaspora experience uh, in the West, as Professor John Charles just mentioned, you know, anti-Blackness is really a global movement. Uh, and 1619 is a particular articulation of anti-Blackness in, in the United States or in what would become the United States. So there's no, not necessarily a reason that, say, a second generation African uh, immigrant student would be familiar with this particular date. But still, the fact that so few people, really no one in my class knew anything about 1619 was something very telling to me about our K-12 educational system 
and even higher education uh, that um, but this particular date isn't as recognizable as other uh, important dates in art history and the history of the United States, say 1776 or 1865. So, uh, you know, there's been quite a bit of debate over the 1619 project and whether it over uh, states the extent to which slavery and racism have defined uh, the American character. And I, I do think that we can have uh, honest disagreements over uh, interpretation, and recognize that there's some factual inaccuracies uh, within uh, that, that some of that reportage without rendering uh, illegitimate the project's larger claim about slavery being uh, the nation's original sin and uh, the durability of anti-Black racism. But uh, racial conservatives have latched on to what they see as the extremist claims of the 1619 Project to characterize academia and also the mainstream media as pushing an anti-American agenda. And so, of course, we see this pushback coming at the highest level from the president's uh, 1776 uh, commission and uh, the speech in which, in which he introduced the commission included him denouncing as unpatriotic any academic endeavor aimed at uh, getting Americans to reckon with our nation's uh, not only racial past, of course, but our, our racist present. And, and so he referenced the 1619 Project, political correctness, which is, which is his go-to critical race theory, uh, both humorous um, coming out of his mouth, but also somewhat disturbing. Um, so for me, uh, in order to really make Black Lives Matter, uh, those of us who are interested in racial justice have to push back ourselves against this uh, conservative agenda. Uh, and to do this is to challenge the notion of American exceptionalism. It's to expose uh, the thinly veiled triumphalist narrative that uh, goes something like this, despite all the stumbles over the past 240 plus years, uh, the nation is really moving toward realizing the democratic ideals upon which it was founded. And I think from my perspective, uh, nothing gets greater lie uh, to this narrative uh, than uh, the past four years, and especially the past six months. Um, now despite the enormous support for Black Lives Matter in the wake of George Floyd's death, uh, and Breonna Taylor's death, and Ahmaud Arbery's death, there's been a noticeable dip in white support over the past few weeks, which raises the question as to whether uh, this racial reckoning that everyone's talking about is more illusory than real. Uh, but more telling is uh, the presidential campaign itself and the prospects of voter suppression in the general election. Now, um, Trump's race baiting, for instance, around the imminent destruction of the suburbs at the hands of Senator Bookie uh, Corr. Cory Booker uh, is a tactic not out of the 1950s, but out of the 1890s. Uh, this fear mongering around the threat that black political power posed to the sanctity of white womanhood uh, back in around the turn of the 20th century led to race riots, of course, and, um, and successful efforts to disfranchise of Blacks. Now, apparently, uh, this isn't playing well in the suburbs in 2020, uh, which are more racially diverse than Trump thinks, but I'll wait until after the election to judge whether or not uh, that kind of racist rhetoric is on its way to becoming a relic of the past. And I think, and short of a complete repudiation of Trump at the polls, it will suggest that this kind of racist rhetoric um, is, 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 continues to resonate with a significant uh, segment of, our, uh, of, of the American public. But while this rhetoric may not be working with uh, white suburban women, I think we need to be specifically concerned about the efforts of voter suppression. Uh, strategies such as purging of the voter rolls, uh, rigid voter ID laws, and physical in intimidation, again, of coming out of the Jim Crow era, as well as, um, as Carol Anderson points out in her book, uh, One Person, No Vote, um, these kind of purging the voter rolls and rigid voter ID laws 
began almost immediately after um, the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And, uh, and I think, you know, it's, it would be remiss uh, uh, of us to not point out some of the organizations that are involved in uh, efforts to suppress the vote, such as uh, the American Legislative Exchange Council, which is funded by uh, the Koch Foundation. Um, so for me, uh, teaching about the structural nature of racism in American history is really central to what I perceive as my mission at the university. And that is making uh, students of all racial, ethnic, and class backgrounds um, aware of the ways that racism shapes nearly every institution in the United States and how some are privileged by it or benefit by it, even though they do not necessarily recognize it. Uh, but just as much as I'm interested in uh, the structural nature of the American racial order, I also think it's important to teach my students about agency, that is agency of the oppressed, right? About the resiliency of Black people, about how Black people have constantly been in struggle uh, to liberate ourselves. And in this sense, I teach history in a way, hopefully that gives students a usable past that they can then use as a template, not for replicating, but rather for expanding and, and, and extending and building upon. So my hope is that uh, this contributes to their formation as they go out and attempt to make the world a better uh, place for not only themselves, but uh, everyone in it. And I have thoughts about how we can collectively make uh, BLM uh, at BC uh, um, really come to fruition, uh, but I'll stop here and, and hold those for uh, the panel discussion. So, thank you. Thanks so much. I invite all the panelists to join us again uh, as a group. Uh, and uh, this is a great moment for us to maybe, you know, engage. Uh, I'd love to have the three of you engage one another uh, around uh, anything that you've heard uh, from uh, from these first presentations. I thought maybe I'd kick it off by by picking up on something. Uh, that you said, Martin, uh, about uh, at the beginning of your uh, your remarks about, uh, and it really connects to everything. I mean, this notion somehow that being, that recognizing the distinctive situation of blackness and black people in this society, and for, as a shorthand, I'll say being pro-black in some way is, is anti-American because what you're doing is identifying flaws in the nation and in so doing you are undermining the nation and so it puts black people in particular in the position of having their experiences in the culture you know being made invisible or or even or just sort of an asterisk uh, when in fact to understand the nation you really have to understand the black experience. Why this this complex uh, pairing? Why is it so difficult for the for the United States to reckon properly with its failures? And why this need for the you know this exceptionalism and this hagiography hey about our perfection? I I think because you know. Uh... Fundamentally, the United States is based on white supremacy, and uh, it, it cannot, um, it cannot acknowledge uh, number one the the humanity of people, let alone uh, the, the 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 right to live uh, in um, you know live without fear, live. Uh, uh, freely uh, live with the same kind of access to uh, economic and uh, political power. Um, and I, I just want to kind of go back to your point. It's just not that Black uh, experiences are rendered in, invisible, but as you said, when Black people who speak out against it, they're not only seen as uh, anti-American, but they are seen as uh, falling kind of outside of what it means to be American to begin with, right? Um, and so, so I, 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 I don't want to say 
enemies of the state, but but in some ways, yes, that you know, it, every kind of uh, liberation movement has been seen as being uh, potentially detrimental to the survival of of the nation as a white supremacist nation, right? Um, and and so I mean, I, you you think about the civil rights movement, um, the ways that. The, the mainstream civil rights movement, the moderate civil rights movement, the way that the, that was framed as being uh, a stalking horse for communism, right, in the 1950s, for instance. Uh, and now we look back at that movement and we look back at uh, what uh, those uh, people were asking for. And, um, and it was hard, it was, it was to be treated as every other American would be treated, right? But somehow it's, it, it's framed as uh, being uh, wanting to destroy America, and, and this is this is what's so frustrating about a lot of the political rhetoric that we hear now, right, around uh, the the Black Lives Matter protests that people want to destroy America. No, nobody wants to destroy America. We want to transform it, but transform it into something that works for everyone, right? Yep. Uh, anyone else want to jump in or wanted to comment on something else? Yeah, I was just thinking about, you know, to me, I mean, because your, your question is a big question, Vince, right? So why is it that the United States does not want to reckon with this past? And I think that part of it, you know, it, it is because, again, white supremacy is the foundation of the United States. But I think that there is also people are afraid of what that will mean because their stuff will be taken away, quite frankly, right? So if you think about even, um, if you think about even Hannah Nicole Jones's trajectory, she went from 1619, and then she started doing this work on reparations, right? And I think that there's a real fear because they know, because people, you know, recognize that the United States would not be where it was were it not, were it not for those foundations in slavery, right? And so I think that there's a fear of what it would mean to actually be an equal society. John? Um, uh, no, um, Professor John Charles pretty much said everything I was going to say. But I, was, <laughs> <laughs> I, I will just add one more part, though, because when you first asked the question, it took me back to you know, one of the foundational readings of one of the you know, forefathers of Black studies, being Du Bois. And Du Bois said, you literally cannot understand the US without understanding the way people of African descent have been treated in the United States. Like you cannot understand the economic system. It's like you cannot study economics and not study how black people have been treated in the United States. You cannot understand psychology without understanding how black people have been treated in the United States. It's like every, so even if you don't care about black people, uh, on a heart level, that even on a form of intellectual perspective, you cannot understand intellectually the ways in which the United States functions if you do not look at the specificity in which people of African descent have been treated in the United States. So even if you don't care about us on a heart level, if you care about intellectual engagement, you cannot understand but he's basically making an argument into um academic institutions if you're not talking about black people you're not doing your job you're not really engaging intellectually because everything every single discipline is uh, is is intimately connected to the treatment and mistreatment of people of african descent since they were brought to this land well let's turn to some uh questions, because I'm sure they'll help us sort of dig down even more into some of the themes that we've been sounding. Um, so uh, let me start with this one uh, from a student perspective. Many Black and African American students like myself struggle to feel included academically when they are the racial minority amongst their peers. Uh, does Boston College have any organizations that combine academics with culture, such as Black pre-med and Black uh, pre-law clubs? And I'm sure we do, and I'm sure those are, there are some you can uh, shout out for our students uh, uh, quickly. I think Professor McGuffey, you should take that because of um, <laughs> you're directing ADS. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say like you know ADS. I would I would I would definitely throw uh, throw that out there. Uh, a lot of what we do is um, 
beyond one of the things that the beauty of AADS that we're so interdisciplinary. You get all, so we get people from nursing, from humanities, from social science. So we're constantly building community and intellectual engagement. But we're also we also build community. Of course, it's different now under COVID. But it used to be people would, you know, students of color would just hang out in the AADS office. It was not uncommon to have a group of students hanging out there building community. But there are some, like I know um, BAIC has something specifically for, for nursing students. Um, so there are places you can go um, um, that can, that you can, they can help build community across these um, um, for specific fields. But I would also encourage you to learn more about uh, not only BAIC, but also AADS. I think we do a good job of forming community for people across different fields. But there are some places you can go to look for a specific um, mentorship in a particular field. And I'm wondering whether or not the various culture clubs, I, I know they must have some academic components. I don't know if they also uh, do any kind of pre-professional development, but I, I, would, I would imagine that that's uh, something that they do, perhaps bringing in uh, speakers or, you know, before COVID, like bringing in uh, speakers to talk about various uh, uh, professional opportunities and things like that. I would, I would hope that some of the culture clubs would do those kinds of things. I know that there's a dean that works specifically with pre-med students, um, black and brown pre-med students. And I would encourage the student, you know, to be the change that you want to see at BC. So start a club. We'll support you happily. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I'd also throw out the professional schools all have uh, organizations for the graduate students that often have events that are open to undergraduates. So, you know, check out what's happening Like at the law school. We have uh, the Black Law Students Association. We have affinity groups for all students of color, you know, unique affinity groups for each group. So, and I'm sure in the business school and some of the other schools, you'll find that as well. Um, this is, uh, this goes uh, also to AADS. Um, so um, what about AADS and the core? How, uh, what, what's going on in terms of bringing AADS into the core uh, and how, and I think I'm gonna add another question just so we can get through all, you know, and how, what other things are happening on campus to improve the black lives and the lives of people of color on campus? Um, well, I, I can speak to the core question. Uh, slightly about uh, on, on the AADS side, but also um, it's more on the history side. Uh, so I think it was probably the, about 20 years ago before I arrived at, at Boston College when the history department revised or re-envisioned its core to make it more global in nature, really move away from a, a Western civilization um, model of history and uh, so there were courses such as Asia in the world, Europe in the world, Latin America in the world, but there was never an African diaspora in the world or an African in the world. So when we hired an Africanist Priya Lal uh, back in 2013, she and I uh, decided to uh, develop a uh, one of these courses, African diaspora in the world, and we've taught it now. Uh, I guess this is our third year that we're teaching it. We, we, we taught it back to back two years and then we um, switched to a model of offering it every other year. And uh, it's been very well subscribed. You know, we have 250 students. Uh, and, and I think, and, and partly I, I should have said that we were responding to um, a demand, right, from Black students that they wanted to see uh, the experiences, the culture, the history of people of African descent reflected in the history core and and so i think it's been uh they, they've responded to it to it to it well they want to, they want us to teach it every year we, we don't want to we don't necessarily want to have to teach it every year but that's also uh, becomes an issue of uh you know uh staffing the ability to staff courses like that too thank you let me um 
but oh, Regine, go ahead. No, I was just going to add to that also that in, you know, the African and African Diaspora Studies program itself, um, when I, both Martin and I actually, when we were hired at Boston College, it was a, a search that was done for uh, a faculty person specializing in any discipline, but that would be joint with African and African Diaspora Studies. And that was in, you know, we started in 2008. And so that was really the beginning of a new kind of wave. And then maybe four years ago, we also had a cluster hire. I still think we have ways to go. I think it would be great for African and African diaspora studies to become a department. Um, it's been 50 years since we've had black studies at Boston College and many of our peer institutions have departmentalized like Georgetown and Notre Dame. Um, but I do think, I do see, especially with the, the, the funding that we've been getting for searches, we have a search, you know, the happening right now that there has been that financial support that has improved for African and African diaspora studies. Here's a, uh, a, a bit of a change. Uh, someone asked, should we feel guilty about the sins of our ancestors or should we see it as a learning opportunity not to repeat them? Well, I mean, I, I just, I think that people respond better to, um, to opportunities to uh, just build a better world, right? Uh, than, than they do by being made to feel guilty about something. Uh, but I also think that that question presumes that, um, that, that racism kind of ends with slavery, right? That, that, that racism ends after, you know, emancipation. Uh, and so therefore, uh, why should I feel guilty about, um, you know, people who have my ancestors who held other people in bondage, not recognizing that they still very much benefit from um, kind of structural or systemic racism that uh, that you know, is 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 based on distributing resources uh, to uh, to whites, right and often at the expense of Blacks, I mean, you know, distributing resources that are in part paid for but, or, or funded by, by Black tax dollars, right? So, so all of these kind of policies that are put in place that have benefited white people, um, that, that is something that persisted well into, into the 20th century. So, uh, you know, that, that question about sins of our ancestors, again, it presumes that racism is something in the past rather than that's something that persists. Well, actually, oh, go ahead, Sean. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I had to pause when that first was asked, cause I, and I think um, Martin did a great job of, of framing that. I just wanted to add a couple um, other parts that is that something that um, Professor John Charles and I say in our class all the time, like, the way that question was say, said, do you do this or this? And one of the central um, basic founding roots of both Black feminism and African, African diaspora studies, we have to get rid of this binary thing. It's not this or this, it's both and. And so we just really thinking about, um, you don't have to, there's, not, there's very seldom one way to respond this way or this way. It's oftentimes a combination. And so I think part of what, when we think about how people should respond to um, um, to oppression is that both and it's you no know, and part of that requires what we talk about student formation being reflective when you for when you do some reflection yeah you might feel guilty and that may be okay because and you're going to do something else if you're truly embracing all this formation processes. So I, I really think it's important to, to, to think about that both and as well as as a continuation of what Martin was saying too, it's not just past racism. It's racism that happened yesterday. It's racism that happened today. It's the microaggressions that students of color um, are experiencing now. When, if you look at the um, climate survey that I talked about earlier, those students are experiencing racism from you know a generation ago. They're talking about the experiencing of racism right now at Boston College. So was, so I think we have to reframe these sort of questions like, do I feel guilty because of this happened in the past? Perhaps you should feel guilty and perhaps you should do something else as part of the reflection process, but you don't have to look to the past to find racism. You can look 
five minutes ago to find the system. Actually, and I'm trying now to kind of collapse several questions into into sort of themes so that we can get to all of them. There are a lot of questions that are asking about one, what students can do and what members of the community can do, but also who, who are asking too about uh, racism beyond anti-black racism and, and how that also is disfiguring the community in significant ways. And I mean, to my mind, one of the things that anti-black racism has taught us in this country is the way that we racialize to other people to, to move them out of the mainstream. And then we say, you know, you are different, but it's not all the same for each group. Uh, but clearly we have, um, we have issues with, you know, anti-Asian ra racism, colorism, other things. So um, how do we kind of in a, in a positive way, you know, recognize the, the critical importance of, of anti-blackness as a kind of foundational question for racism in this country, but also engage these other types of racism that, that are also a present in our community and in our country. So I, I'm sorry, Regine, did you want to respond? Sure. Um, I was going to say, you know, I, I do think, again, this is where the both end that, you know, Professor McGuffey and I always teach our students to talk about and that you can both um, you know, be anti-racist or concerned about anti-Black racism and work in solidarity with people from the Asian community, from the Latinx community. I remember a, another, I guess, anecdotal example. Um, last year, I was teaching a Black Feminisms class. I have a class that's called Black Feminisms 101. And I had two Muslim students in my class and they were talking about the fact that the speaker was coming to campus. And they were like, but it's too late to organize. And the, sorry, this, this speaker who is documented, has documented Islamophobic comments, right? And anti-Muslim comments. And, um, you know, the students thought, were saying like, oh, well, but it's too late to organize. And I'm like, what do you mean it's too late to organize? It's never too late to organize. And they're like, well, how would we get, I mean, because it's, it's a small community, the Muslim community of BC. And I'm like, and I said to them, but what about all the other people that are, can be in solidarity with you, right? And it was really wonderful when the students came back and they reported um, what had happened that, you know, they, there were students from the Black Student Forum they came, there were students that came from other groups to be in solidarity over this issue, right? So I think that there are examples um, of those kinds of coalitions on campus where you give strength to one another because there are not many of you on campus, right? And that's one of the reasons why they, you know, when, when they use the AHANA numbers as opposed to only the numbers of the Black students or only the Latinx students um, because their numbers are low. But when you all work together, you can really enhance one another. And you don't, it doesn't have to take away from the struggle of any student. You stand in solidarity. This is what, this is how coalitions are built, right? This is something that we see throughout the history of organizing that coalitions are a necessary part of this work. If I, I'm so glad that you had um, shared that anecdote because I had a, a, an, an, a anecdote that was not quite opposite, but um, was, was not as hopeful. Uh, and, and this is, you know, I, and I was struck when Sean in his uh, remarks was talking about the importance of recognizing the specificity of, of anti-Black racism, which, which I agree with. But um, I, I, this, I recall I was, being, I was teaching this course, Gender and Sexuality in African American History, and it was uh, the, the fall um, that we, were, we had the, that um, those hate crimes on campus, like the cheesesteak incident and uh, Black Lives Don't Matter um, vandalism. Uh, and uh, so shortly after that, we were, we were just talking about this as a class. And, uh, and there was a, one of my students is a woman of color, uh, I'm not entirely sure what her ethnic background was, but she wanted to share some experiences that she had had, right, um, on campus, but she was apologetic about it. And uh, I mean, to the point where she's like, is this the right space to kind of talk about this? And that was really painful for me to, uh, to, to witness that, uh, that, that and, and so while I think that you know, as Sean pointed out, it's, it's really important to talk about the specificity of anti-Black uh, racism, recognize the specificity of anti-Black racism. I do think that we have to move to a point where we can um, ha be, have these conversations 
about the, the various ways in which uh, different groups experience racism uh, without delegitimizing uh, either any of those groups' experience. And then out of that, as, 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 uh, as Professor John Charles said, build, build solidarity right, um, across groups. So uh, there are a lot of questions about additional work that we can do. And it sounds like one answer we've given, I think, is in terms of building solidarity, building coalitions, uh, building allyship. Um, maybe uh, someone else asked about some of the things that we are doing, uh, that, that you all are doing uh, in uh, African and African diaspora studies to engage upper class students. And maybe we can talk a little bit more about formation more broadly in terms of the curriculum and other things that we can be doing moving forward uh, to to move these issues forward. Well, one thing that I will say is that there, so I saw that FACES came up in the chat, um, which is an excellent organization that has been doing anti-racist work on campus for a very long time. And um, well, for as long as I've been at Boston College. <laughs> um, and I do think it's important that we think about what are the other areas um, on campus where this work is happening in different ways, right? And so, for example, tonight, um, my sister colleague, Do Reverend Dr. Amy Victoria Atkins Jones, is giving a talk on Do Black Lives Matter to God for the um, STM. And um, that's an important, you know, that's an important intervention, right, that she's making in that in that context. Uh, also, uh, my friend Katie Dalton has for maybe, I think, five or six years now started the RISE program, which is for senior women. Um, and this is to the question about opportunities for upperclassmen. And again, even though it is not um, uh, even though it is, it is, it is, it's, it's a program for women. All women are invited to attend. There are a number of the mentors who are black. So it's a mentoring program, and it's faculty or staff who mentor um, the women. And they're very intentional about how they pair people. And so often, what you see is that you know, I'll have a student. Some of my mentees will say, "I've requested you to be my," or some of my students will request to become my mentees. And that became a really wonderful space where we were able to um, talk about these issues in a safe space. Um, with other black women who are upperclassmen, black and brown women who are upperclassmen, and also to talk about, you know, possible solutions, right? And this is important for as students are leaving Boston College too, right? Because we, they have four years here, but, you know, formation doesn't stop when you leave Boston College. Hopefully these are the building blocks for how you will live your life later on. So I absolutely agree that we need to be able to get to the, the upperclassmen. And I think that in ADS, you know, now that we have African African diaspora studies as a major. Um, we do have the opportunity to do more of that work as people write theses. One of my favorite classes to teach has been the capstone seminar for seniors in the African African diaspora studies program. And again, you know, we look at the the, the how the diaspora has been theorized. It's a global class. We talk about all of these issues. And we do so with a lot of reading and a lot of discussion. Um, so that's another opportunity, majoring or minoring in African and African diaspora studies. I would also just throw out there too that um, uh, BAIC has some wonderful mentoring programs where they actually pair, um, you know, um, older or like, I think it's juniors and senior Ahana students with um, younger Ahana students. So there's also that be a way to get engaged. And again, I would just reiterate um, a lot of things with uh, Professor John Charles says, like you know, ABS. It, um, well, at least when we could meet, we had that space, like you would see, I, I would, because the, uh, I would hear from my office mentoring going on between um, um, younger AES, AABS students talking about how do you navigate BC as a racist terrain and older AABS students giving them very real advice on this is how you navigate this space, this is how you find community, this is how you, if you do experience um, um, racism, sexism, heterosexism, these are ways in which you can address it. So there are spaces that we, that we, that we see that here. And I'm proud to say, I think ABS is one of those spaces that, that, that does that, both formally and informally. Well, I wanna give each of you a chance to 
to offer some closing thoughts. And we have so many wonderful questions. And unfortunately, we can't answer them all. But what I'll try to do when I close the event is maybe touch on a few things that have came up. So, uh, but let me let each of you say a few words. And you you see some of the questions as well. And you can use that uh, perhaps to draw out any theme that you'd like to touch upon as, as we close. This is such an important and obviously complex and large topic. And the forum is hoping to work on it, you know, for. Uh, in many different ways ac across uh, you know the months and years ahead, but uh, this is our beginning, and um, I'm glad that we're here together to to do this. So, uh, Sean, let me begin with you. All right. Um, again, thank you all for inviting me, and thank you all for um, the other panelists. Um, it's, I, I know you all personally, but it's it's great to be in this intellectual engagement um, here. Um, it's like. I say this sincerely, like you all are part, one of the main reasons I've stayed at BC. So I really do appreciate the camaraderie that I get from, from you all. Um, as far as thoughts go, uh, I, I'm just gonna narrow this down because um, we have been here for a while. I do believe Zoom fatigue is a real thing. Um, I really wanna push um, Boston College and I, and I say this, in the same way James Baldwin says, I, we have the right to critique America because we love it so much. And so when I, I, my critiques of Boston College at this particular moment should be um, taken in that particular way. I, I really feel, it, uh, I, I, um, I, as I said to Vince when, I, when we first started talking about this, I, I appreciate this invitation to be here, but I'm really concerned about what happens next. Is this going to be another box that Boston College checks off and says, oh, we did this form during this heightened state of racial anxiety in the country, and therefore we can say we've done something. Um, I, my hope for this is that this leads to actual change. And we're going to see um, how this particular historical moment is going to shape the future of Boston College beyond just sitting here having a conversation. I think Boston College does a really good job of holding conversations. I'm less, um, I'm less sure on the follow through after the conversation. And so I want to figure out, I want, and I hope as we keep having these conversations, these forums, that we start to build in ways in which we keep Boston College as a university accountable to the specificity of anti-blackness on its campus. Um, and I do believe as, um, you know, Professor Summers says that we have to take other um, groups um, experience of racism as, um, uh, as important and to address that as well. But if you look simply at the data, the black students on this campus are having a significantly worse time than any other group on this campus. Um, so I do think there's importance of the specificity of understanding and addressing anti-blackness on this campus. And if you believe in um, the tenets of black feminist theory, if you help the most marginalized, everyone benefits. Because in order to get to that level of specificity, there's so many layers you have to address just to get there. You actually are helping everyone. Um, so I, I really want us to figure out how are we going to the, this form, how are we going to keep the university accountable for addressing these issues um, so that we're not here next year having this exact same discussion because another black woman or a black man has been killed. Um, so that's where I really want us to push is like, what is next? How do we hold the university accountable? How do we hold ourselves accountable? Because that's also important as we move on. Um, and again, I say that because I actually love Boston College. I've been, a, I've, stayed, I've been here and I've stayed here for a reason because I do love the university despite the many flaws that I see that it has. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Sean. Yes, that uh, the great Fannie Lou Hamer said, nobody's free until everybody's free. And I really do believe, believe that and live by that. And, you know, usually when we have the meetings for the forum, I'm always saying, action, action, funded action, action. And you took, you took my words. So I, I am going to take some words from your mother who says, um, we're all swimming in the same dirty water. And so Professor McGuffey's mother is this amazing 
black woman from Kentucky. And when she says we're, sw oh, we're all swimming in the same dirty water, she's referring to racism, right? So that means that all of us, me, Regine, Sean, Martin, Vince, all of us are swimming in the same dirty water. And so there are ways in which we are also complicit in maintaining some of these structures. And that's why it does require that deep work of reflection, right? I have a colleague that says, you know, thinking about justice, we say we care about justice, but how are we thinking about creating more justice, right? So I would challenge you all, how can you create more justice? Ask yourself that question every day because it relates to so many things. It relates to what you eat, what you wear, how you speak to people, who you see, how you interact with people. How do you create more justice? I invite you to ask that question. And lastly, I'll say I, I spoke at a panel. I did something like this yesterday for Georgetown um, that was specifically about intersectionality uh, and the role of the university in advancing racial justice was their title. Um, but my session was on intersectionality and we talked about gender. And the title of their series is For Such a Time as This. And that comes from the book of Esther, for if you don't know. And um, Queen Esther was someone who, she was trafficked. First of all, she was marginalized in her situation. She was sexually exploited. And she also said something that I think is very important that we never want to quote in our justice movements, which is, if I perish, I perish. So she wanted to seek an audience for the king so that she could advocate for her people. And she said, if I will ask for an audience with the king, if I perish, I perish. And I think that that is also important to think about, right? That it has to cost you something, that it has to cost you something. So if you're trying again to create more justice, it has to cost you something. Are we willing to say, if I perish, I perish when it comes to these questions? I know I'm not always there. I have four children. I'm like, oh no, I can't perish. You know, I don't want to perish. <laughs> um, but you know, I think that that is what the that is what true freedom and true justice really requires of us to make those kinds of sacrifices. And lastly, I will say, you know, um, Professor McGuffey and I always talk to our students about the importance of joy. And I was so happy when Martin brought up agency and how we teach Black studies and how we teach in African African diaspora studies because it is so important um, to remember that you know what's exhausting is racism blackness is not exhausting we love being black it's wonderful <laughs> there's a lot of joy there's a lot of celebration that happens in our classrooms i have laughed until i've had tears with my students as much as i have cried with my students um so i wanted to leave everyone with that too that this is hard work that we're doing but you know the joy is also in the resistance or we have to find joy to fuel that resistance Again, I have to follow that. Come on. Uh, it's like going from poetry to prose. Uh, so I, I guess uh, uh, I'm going to respond uh, as a way of wrapping up to Akosua Champong's uh, question. Wonderful uh, AADS minor who graduated a number of years ago. And she, she asked, how, how can BC as, a, as, an, institute, as an institution uh, that prides itself on, on justice? really galvanize um, the majority white student body and, and faculty to, um, to really commit uh, to uh, what we've been talking about and really making Black Lives Matter on, on campus. And so um, a couple of things came to me, and I think these are connected when we talk about the majority white student body and faculty. Um, and one is I think that uh, BC needs to continue to uh, um, invest in uh, core renewal courses and these other different, I think the terminology has changed now, difference, justice, and common good. I don't think that's the, 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 um, the, the, the phrase now, but, but really these courses that uh, complex questions, uh, and I'm sorry, complex problems, enduring questions, are ones that really uh, uh, tackle uh, issues of racism and anti-Black racism uh, in uh, from a historical and, and, and contemporary and cultural uh, perspective. Um, but in order to do that, I, um, there, there's so few faculty of color, faculty who do work on race on this campus. So in order to do that, we actually need to expand the number of faculty who do race, right? And the, and, and, and the faculty of color on this campus. So, uh, and so in that sense, I think, I think that the university really needs to invest in diversifying its faculty. Um, and that means um, uh, 
significant cluster hires. Uh, you know, I think about some of the departments on this campus uh, have one uh, faculty, one tenured or tenure track faculty of color. If, if we were talking about a department that had, uh, you know, 99% men and 1% women, women, uh, one, and, you know, one woman, it would be, you know, it wouldn't be it would be intolerable, right? I mean, I think that's, we have to really commit ourselves in, as an institution to diversifying uh, our faculty. And, and, um, and I think that's one of the ways in which uh, the university can, um, can really commit to uh, Black Lives Matter. Well, I want to thank uh, each of our panelists and thank all of you in the audience for, for joining this, this uh, conversation and participating uh, with us. We only had 90 minutes to, to talk today. Uh, and many of you have asked about what other things are going to be happening. And uh, please uh, know that the, the forum is working uh, to you know, in, uh, provide and to uh, organize additional uh, activities but it really isn't just about the forum this forum is 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 a is a launching place uh and a gathering space uh and and a point of engagement uh, for the entire community to think about these issues and to then bring them into their schools departments uh programs uh and you know to continue the work and this is work that we all need to be doing together and i'm you know really thankful and pleased that so many of you took the time this evening to be a part of this conversation. I want to remind you that next week we're going to have a, a, one of the cre courageous conversations. Um, we're going to discuss racial justice in our current po political uh, moment, uh, racial justice and democracy and being a democratic citizen and using the model of courageous conversations, which allows us to do that work in a productive and safe way for all the participants. Uh, so uh, I encourage you to take a look at that on our website uh, in terms of how you might be able to participate. There will be another event at the end of the month, uh, the solidarity event that uh, is a vigil for racial justice. Uh, so uh, we'll be doing as much as we can. But again, it's not just about what the forum does and it's not just about what, it's, what what African and African diaspora studies does. It's about what we all do. And the fact that we are all engaged in this moment and in this issue and understanding the transformative nature of really thinking properly and carefully and honestly about racial justice in America, about racism in America, about black lives and a moving forward uh, to create something better and something new. So uh, I'm very hopeful for BC. I think this is a wonderful community. I think we have a lot to offer the world. Uh, and uh, I know that we will do this work together and move forward stronger and better when we do. So thanks for being with us tonight. Good night to everyone and look forward to seeing you.